le 25 décembre, on était dehors. Quand on a eu la tension attirée par un bruit, c'était un avion qui passait à basse altitude, qui était attaqué par des avions allemands. En arrivant là, il a perdu un moteur. L'avion s'est incliné et il est allé se cracher ici à, à 200 mètres. Et de là, il y avait, au départ, il y en a un qui a voulu sauter et qu'on a retrouvé longtemps après. Et les et deux qui ont sauté près, près du crash, mais euh, ils ont sauté trop tard, l'avion était trop bas et ils étaient tués tous les deux là. Et les, et les autres sont restés dans l'avion qui s'est craché ici. Et là, il y, en a, il y a eu trois, trois survivants là. Mais quand on est parti, on a, quand on a, on a évacué, on est passé tout près, sur la route près de l'avion là. Et là, les deux parachutistes qui avaient sauté, là au-dessus, à 50 mètres au-dessus de, 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 de la route, étaient roulés dans leur parachute et on les avait mis le long de la route pour les reprendre, pour reprendre les cours. Hein. Ah ben ça, c'est, c'est, quand on fait, c'est, c'est, ça, ça, ça a marqué ça, de voir les, des gens tués ou quoi, ça, ça. Oui. As-tu, as-tu cru de trouver l'équipe où il y avait un moment où tu as cru de... Jamais... Moi, je pensais qu'on ne ouais, qu'on retrouverait jamais l'équipage. Hein. L'avion, je savais c'est tout, mais l'équipage, j'ai dit, on ne saura jamais. Hein. Mais j'ai acheté le terrain parce que je savais bien que l'avion était craché là et que pour que personne n'aille... n'aille et, et que je puisse avoir la, la chance de, d'y aller moi-même avec des camarades ou quoi et dire, voilà... On, on, il venait de là, hein. et puis là, il a, tourné, il a viré à, à droite des autres, on ne sait pas pourquoi. Uh-huh. Mais lui, il voulait um, essayer d'atterrir au-dessus, sur le, c'était des grandes pâtures, 300-400 mètres, bien plat. Ouais. Et là, au-dessus, près d'un chalet, là, il a perdu un moteur. Là, là. Ouais. Et l'avion s'est incliné, et, de, oui, et il est venu, là, les autres ont voulu sauter mais trop tard, ah, ouais. et puis il est venu se planter ici. Hein. Je, il y a tellement longtemps que j'aurais bien voulu retrouver l'équipage de l'avion. On m'envoyait là, va là, j'allais là, non, va là, j'allais là, non. Tu vois, ça, ça, la maison là, ça, ça a été brûlé. Celle-là aussi est brûlée. C'est des nouvelles après la guerre. Hein. These houses were on fire during the Battle of the Bulls. And this is his old house. In June uh, 2013, I was contacted by the community of Manhay. They had given me a permit for metal detecting uh, in the area. And uh, they were contacted by an elderly guy named Victor Janssen. Uh, and he wanted some help with uh, identifying a plane and its crew uh, that he saw uh, crashing during the Battle of the Bulge in the meadows of La Fosse, where Victor lives. We contacted Victor, of course. Uh, we gave him a call. We went by, my son Tom and myself, and we had uh, metal detectors with a uh, bucket, shovels already in, in the car. We were really excited to start a project like this. And um, when we arrived at the scene, Victor was outside. He took us straight to the crash site, which was uh, uh, in the middle of the meadows of La Fosse, surrounded by trees, brushes, uh, totally overgrown. And we entered that little bush, and I immediately saw debris. Uh, on the ground and pieces of the plane. Uh, So the first time we just started picking up pieces. 
put it in the buckets, take it home, and try to identify the things we found. And what was really um, surprising to me that the imprint of the belly of that plane was still visible uh, in the crash site. So it gave you an idea where the nose was, where the wings were and the tail. So when you were digging and you find a piece that was special, we could determine in what part of the plane uh, should have been. So uh, this is part of all the findings we, uh, we have done during the years. Uh, most of the stuff is in the basement and this one I know it's part of the flak vest. It's just a little, little plate. Uh, this one's nice, uh, 0.50, 50 cal, plastic. And this part is the, for me, it's the most important part. It's the first thing that I found after entering the, the little patch of wood with, with Tom, my son, and, and Victor. And I just lay on the ground. I picked it up. And of course, it had more sand and dirt. And after our first search, I went home and tried to look it up. And somebody that I know, his name is Paul, he helped me. Uh, identifying, he said, it's a part of the Northern bomb site. It's the best invention during, during World War II in airfare. And, uh, well, I, I have it always with me. It's next to me, always next to me when I'm working at my desk. And some, sometimes I just pick it up and, and look at it. And uh, yeah, it's a really cool thing. We try to identify the plane by, uh, of course, digging up all the pieces and hoping to find uh, a clue or a plate that could identify the plane. And in the beginning, we were looking for a B-17 because Victor remembered it as a B-17 plane. And after two years of digging, and looking up on the internet and using all the sources that I had at that time, uh, we found um, a pressed piece of wood. Yeah, let's go to the small museum in the back. So this is, this is a, another box with stuff. It's meant to be uh, for the small museum in the back that we have. This is one of the plates of the engines. So for two years we have been looking for a B-17 until I found this piece of pressed wood. Took it home, tried to match it with the B-17 and could not find it anywhere. And then I thought, okay, maybe it's another plane that is possible. And then I found this piece in a B-24. It's a part of the bomb bay to open the bomb bay, release the bombs. So for two years, we've been looking for the wrong plane. And from that day on, I started looking for a B-24, made a list with all the planes that went down between, I think it's like 20 December and um, 27 December. And uh, well, we, we did the research all over again. My name is Myra Miller and I'm an archive researcher. I happen to live in St. Louis, Missouri, which is where the archives holds all of the personnel files, the burial files, and the morning reports for World War II. And that is how I bring together the documents to help support the mission. 
Well, I had taken a tour uh, with uh, some people through Belgium and I had stayed at Bob Koning's Bed and Breakfast in Grand Manil, Belgium. And he called me up one day and asked if I would help support his plane crash research. Because he told me the story about Victor and how he had always, since he was six years old, uh, needed help finding the crew and I was all on board once I knew that uh, there was a story to be told. So in working with Bob, um, our goal was to help support the stories of the plane crash. In addition, I was doing some research for stories of World War II myself. And so we went together and we found some civilians in the La Fosse, Belgium area to hear their story about th them growing up through the war and the, and the situations that they encountered. Uh, these were young children at the same time, or young family members who witnessed war at the most vulnerable period of their lives. J'habitais à Sadzo, un petit village de 13 maisons, euh, tout près des Rosilles. J'avais neuf mois. Nous habitions cette maison aussi. Ah oui. oui. Et la nuit du 27 au 28 décembre 44, les Allemands nous entouraient comme ceci, enveloppés dans une couverture et elles se mettaient au-dessus de moi pour me protéger parce que les bombardements venaient de toutes parts. Et à un moment donné, une grenade a explosé dans notre chambre et j'ai pleuré. Et ma reine, papa et maman se sont dit, elle a eu peur, ce qui était normal que je pleure. Oui. Ça fait qu'on est resté assis. Nous sommes descendus et dans la cuisine ici se trouvaient des Allemands qui nous ont laissé passer, mais ils nous ont suivis et on est venu ici à l'étable. Mais là, à l'étable, ils nous ont mis en joue en disant, pas bouger. Ah, Donc oui. on est resté des heures sans bouger. Et alors, euh, vers le matin, euh, on a bombardé la maison, elle l'a brûlé. Et heureusement, les Américains, par cette fenêtre-ci, ont vu qu'on était là. Alors, ils nous ont sauvés, nous ont libérés, et ils ont fait les Allemands prisonniers. Et nous sommes allés chez des, voisins, chez des amis à Sadzo, qui, qui nous ont pris, on m'a débaillotté, et là, on a vu que j'étais blessé et pendant, le, pendant la nuit et le matin mes parents disaient c'est drôle que Claudine ne pleure pas pour avoir à manger mais j'étais trop faible je n'aurais plus su pleurer et c'est un médecin américain qui m'a soigné pendant des jours et des jours et on voyait là parce que j'avais certainement eu un trou comme ça dans, dans l'épaule Les Allemands étaient déjà dans notre village. Hein? C'est sûr, ça mitraille. Hein? Uh, my good friend Eddie Monfort's father, Alphonse, was uh, a little boy when the, the Germans invaded his town of Malamprey. And he tells me the story that he and his family had to uh, hide in the cellar of their house. We're talking a whole family for over a week. They couldn't go outside. I mean, here's a little boy. Imagine not being able to go outside to play or do anything. They were hiding in their cellar. And he tells me that in one corner was a sack of potatoes, and that's all they had to eat. And then the other corner was a bucket, and that's where they had to go to the bathroom. And could you imagine just what, it just gives me chills to think that what he went through, and he's, he personally told me these stories and and then hearing how he felt when the liberators came through. So in Alphonse telling the story about his situation, again, once again, he didn't know anything about the plane crash that we were searching for, but he had a great story to tell, uh, which was very important that we were here to hear it and to share it. So then we went to see Madame Satzo, and we had heard that she knew about a plane crash, and it ended up being a different plane crash called the Joker. But we had hoped that maybe the crew from our plane somehow had ended up at her house because she had had some visitors 
through, uh, through the war with her family. Die van Birmen, die, ja. die came here. Ja. Die, die was scared for the German. Ja. And the, the, the plane crashed. And the, the, they didn't know what, what happened. What will we do with the, the people? They were afraid, scared for the German. And they put them to the teacher. And the teacher knew we were patriots. And they brought them here. And they uh, have a bit... Uh, being in the hay loft, yeah. and I think there were five, but I don't know their names. I think, I think that's Only correct. their surname, that was Kit, that was Manu, that was special. Well, they didn't say their name, huh? uh -huh. that was yeah, too, only too, ah, to prevent too uh, dangerous. Uh, I know, I know. nothing but, about La Fosse, it's but only Benmanil the, the, the Joker. Since she could not help us out, we had to continue our research somehow, so um, I went forward with archival research through the United States Archives. So the most important thing with uh, the plane crash I was looking for, I was looking for IDPFs, which is the Individual Deceased Persons file, burial files, and uh, because those indicate a lot of great deal about a death of a soldier or uh, died of wounds or anybody who was killed in action. So I, I was spending several weeks looking at all these different guys and as soon as I would get a folder and I could see that their plane crashed in some place other than La Fosse, uh, I knew it wasn't our plane. So we were looking for B-24s and I had a list for about 15, 16 B-24s that crashed in the, um, in the Ardennes or in the area of the Ardennes. Um, but none of them, I, I could none of them match with, with this area. Uh, the missing aircraft report said they told about uh, in crashed in Germany or Luxembourg or at the border with Belgium. Saint Fiet was a popular place. Uh, Prüm in Germany was a popular place. So that was a bit uh, annoying, but also uh, surprising that I could not match one of the planes in this area. None of them. So in, um, I think, yeah, it was in November 2017, so four years later, that I decided to quit with the investigation. Uh, I didn't think we, we could match it at all. Um, so I went to Victor one night uh, and I told him that it was probably impossible to find a plane. We couldn't get it matched. And, Ah ben moi je voulais euh, reconnaissance à ces gens-là qui ont donné le, le se sont sacrifiés pour notre liberté. Si on n'avait pas eu ces gens-là, si on n'avait pas eu les Américains, ben il n'y a pas de problème. Hein? Parce que ceux-là, au moins je les ai vus longtemps là, que les, les autres tués, ben directement ils sont embarqués. On a... Moi, moi j'ai essayé de trouver quelqu'un qui... parce que je dis on m'a envoyé à Comblain, on m'a dit va là. On va dire de l'avion et tout. Je suis allé là. On m'a dit non, ça ne va pas. Va là. So Victor was very disappointed that. that time but he understood and on my way back it was only a couple of minutes drive uh, we passed by the cross site uh, we always did my wife Evelyn she asked can you give it one more try for this man it's his dream he's getting older and there's a chance that he never gets his dream fulfilled So I contacted everybody, all the, the guys that I've been working with on the crash site and on the internet. Uh, they come from America, Germany, England, Belgium, Netherlands. And asked them, do you have any suggestion left that could help us to find the plane? So we had a nice discussion online. 
And uh, at one point, one of the guys said, I know a fellow in England. His name is David Pratt. You can contact him. So I directly uh, tried to connect with David Pratt. And um, he said, well, a plane in La Force is, I, I, I know a lot of crash planes, but it doesn't ring a bell. So the first time the conversation was a bit brief, but he, he said, well, I will look for it. But then within a day, I got another uh, suggestion from one of the, the, the Flemish guy. And he said, um, I know a Flemish guy, his name is Steven Volkart, and he might be able to help you. So I tried to contact this guy and he was very fast in responding and I, I asked Stephen, um, Stephen Volkart, can you help me with this plane? And he said, I researched 3000 planes and I'm at my work at the moment, so I don't have the information available yet, but then came, but I think it's the 4250612. And I was totally flabbergasted. This guy was at work and he came up with a number and I recognized the number, 4250612. So he said, well, if I'm getting home from my work, I will look it up directly. But I was so eager to continue directly that I contacted back David Pratt. And I said, David, I have a number. Can you look that up for me? 4250612 and within an hour I was looking at a, a, a bit blurry picture uh, from a telephone of a book saying 4250612 king size that was the nickname crashed in the meadows of La Fosse on December 25 1944 I was totally flabbergasted within a day or two we had solved the case I had a number I had the nickname of the plane and we already had been on the list for years. But the, the, the uh, missing aircraft report said it crashed in Prume, not in La Fosse, it crashed in Prume. So all those years we were looking at the right plane but couldn't match it with, with the location. So with that information I directly went to Myra, she was still up and I, of course, I was totally excited. Myra, I think we have the plane. And at that point, I knew which reports to request from the archives because I had the names, I had the ASN numbers, and so I immediately submitted those requests to the archives and was waiting patiently for the files to come in so I could go research because we knew we had the plane at this point, and now I had submitted the seven, eight, nine, ten files that I had submitted, I was waiting for them. Um, this is where I get a little excited and emotional at the same time because the first file that I got was Owen Fox's file. And at this point I didn't know, you know, it was just like every other file. I'd already done like 30 files and I opened the folder up and I looked and the first page I turned to, in fact, first page I turned to, I looked down and I saw the word LaFosse. And my heart started beating just like it is right now. I mean, I cannot tell the story without getting uh, so emotional. And I saw the word LaFosse and I'm like, oh my God, this is it. On that same night that I had contact Myra, on the same night, I, I played a, a great game. Uh, we also had team member Marco here and my old son Thomas uh, at home. So I asked Evelyn to give a call to Victor if we could have a meeting, a rendezvous at his home. So Victor said, okay, you, you can come over. And, and I, so I said, I will be there at eight o'clock. So, with Marco and Evelyn, Tom and myself, we got to the house, he opened the door and he was surprised that I was not alone, but with a little group. So we entered the house and uh, he said, what's going on, what can I do for you? And I said, Victor, sit down, we have the plane. 
Oui, je suppose que tu te souviens le soir que Bob est arrivé ici pour te dire qu'on a trouvé ouais. l'équipage. Est-ce que tu te souviens encore euh, l'impact sur toi ça, 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 ça... Oui, quand Bob m'a expliqué qu'on avait trouvé des, des, des gens de l'équipage, ça m'a émotionné, ça, parce que j'ai dit, oula, on va peut-être retrouver l'équipage. De, 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 de... Et en effet, ça s'est bien déroulé et on a retrouvé. Quand Bob m'a dit qu'on avait retrouvé un, et puis, et puis deux, et puis on, on a retrouvé tout l'équipage, c'est ça. Ça m'a fait plaisir, ça, ça m'a fait... Ouais. Yeah, I'm Peter Ferdinand. Um, I'm son of Peter F. Ferdinand, who was a radio operator on the crew of King Size that crashed on Christmas Day uh, during 1944, during the Battle of the Bulge. Yeah, my father told me quite a bit over the years about his military service. Um, he didn't speak to everyone about it, but he thought it was important to share a lot of those details with me. And he thought it was important that the sacrifices of his crewmates was never forgotten. He told me quite a bit about his training in the States, uh, training to be a radio operator, um, and then uh, being assigned to his first crew, and then uh, flying over to their air base in Hethel, England. Um, my dad had quite a few, uh, well, we said he had nine lives. He had quite a few uh, close calls during his service period. Uh, he flew 16 missions until he was shot down that day on Christmas Day. Uh, and he told me quite a bit of uh, his, his adventures on Liberty, going to London and his, his, his days off and having pass and, and going to see parts of England and so forth that, uh, you know, that a, a small town guy in Pennsylvania probably didn't think he had a chance to see in his lifetime. Um, he had a lot of uh, stories to tell about his, his combat experience uh, and how lucky he was to make it back uh, when many of his friends and his crewmates did not. Uh, he was first assigned to a crew uh, on his original plane called the Old Glory. Um, they had flown about 15 missions uh, until they were involved in a mid-air collision over his base in November of 1944. My dad was lucky enough to escape um, after the mid-air collision. Uh, he bailed out through the top hatch, and from what he told me, his parachute opened only a few hundred feet off the ground. Uh, my dad was one of two survivors um, that day, and uh, after landing near the wreckage, he tried to run into the burning aircraft and save other members that were, were in, in the crew. Um, for a short period of time, between November and Christmas Day, he was uh, allowed to recuperate some, and uh, he was called upon to fly again on Christmas Day. Uh, he was woken up in the early morning hours, and he was asked to fly as a replacement radio operator that day on the King, or the crew of the King Size. Um, their radio operator had completed one extra mission. And what my father told me, he, this, this would have been the last mission that the crew of the King Size was going to fly. They were going to go home. As a child, and even as an adult, my father rarely talked to my sisters and me about his service in the war. But the one time he did say something to me, I was an adult, he was sitting at home, this was before I was married, and he said, you know, Diane, the only reason I'm alive today is because I always wore my parachute. He said, I always told my crew members, put on your chute, put on your chute. 
And because the plane was so confined, they had problems wearing their parachutes on their back. Uh, and they couldn't move around and do their jobs as well. However, my dad, being very clever, when it was time to sign out for his parachute, he signed out as Lieutenant Ferdinand. And uh, at that time, he was not a lieutenant, he was a sergeant. And the lieutenants were given the uh, parachutes, the seat parachutes that they could sit upon. So he did not have to move around the plane like his comrades, and uh, he was prepared. As a matter of fact, I just found out a few years ago, they nicknamed him Parachute Pete. It was uh, Christmas Day, and uh, from what he had told me, uh, that most of the uh, air crews were grounded up until that point. Uh, the bad weather had, had uh, come in and it was finally beginning to clear. So he told me that everything that could fly that day was going to fly. So um, he was under the impression it was going to be uh, kind of an easy run to uh, the area of Luxembourg and to Germany and that they would uh, have a pretty easy shot of it and, and return home. Well, um, according to the missing aircraft report, um, they uh, left from Hethel Air Base went to Walen in Germany. They bombed out uh, uh, Walen, the, the communication center there. And then on the way back to uh, Hethel Air Base, it was attacked by several uh, German fighters. He told me that after they had dropped their bombs on their target, they were hit by approximately 15 German fighter planes, uh, Focke Wolf FW-190s. Uh, they were there were, there were quite a few planes. He estimated there were about 15 aircraft that were um, attacking his, his group. Uh, they had fallen out of formation and uh, they were kind of sitting ducks at this point. After that, um, their, their plane had caught fire uh, and they were losing altitude. Um, at that point, the pilot regained control of the plane and uh, they were hit again by the German fighter planes. It's a bit of a guess with, with some of the guys, but we figured out that uh, the first one that got out of the plane when it was hit the second time by German fighters was Leon Liskamp. Um, unfortunately, he landed behind German lines, uh, got captured, and he was later brought back to Bitburg in Germany. And inside the plane, uh, Ray, Ray Price, uh, the pilot, already had given the order to evacuate the plane. So Bob Ball and Peter Ferdinand, they were trying to help out Walter Abley. After the second round of attacks, uh, his pilot, Captain Price, gave the order to bail out. Their plane was on fire at this point. So um, my dad and his um, engineer, um, Sergeant Everly, try to escape by jumping up and down on the bomb bay doors uh, of the plane. But keep in mind that at this point the plane was on fire and they were losing altitude and they were going down. Uh, after the bomb bay doors did not open, they decided to bail out through the nose wheel uh, area in the front of the plane. So my father and um, Sergeant Eberly went to the nose wheel area of the plane uh, and decided to exit through that area. Um, my dad told me at that point there were no other crew members in the front of the plane. Uh, being the nose gunner and the navigator were, were no longer there. Um, my father decided to, to lower himself out through the nose wheel, thinking that that would show Sergeant Everly that it was safe to bail out. Sergeant Everly uh, was afraid to jump at that point. Uh, my dad bailed out and um, Sergeant Everly never uh, decided to bail out at that point. Um, while, while descending in his parachute, um, my dad could see uh, German forces uh, throughout uh, the, the valley uh, in the Ardennes area. Um, at that point, uh, he heard some snicking sounds, which he attributed to Germans firing at him while he was coming down. As he was descending in his parachute, uh, he saw an explosion, uh, which was his airplane. Yeah. So after landing um, and, and jumping out of his harness and uh, running into the woods, uh, he told me that he had hidden out for three days. Together with Bob Ball, they jumped out. And, uh, Bob Ball was lucky, he landed behind American lines, and Peter landed behind German lines. And, uh, uh, so they were next. The following is uh, Owen Fox. They already flew over uh, 
the woods of La Fosse, and we think he got blown out of the plane. Uh, and maybe already died when he got out. Uh, something happened, really, really bad happened there. Tout ça, c'était des chants, hein? Ouais. Ah, il... il avait défait. Jules avait fait toute pâture et tout, tout ça, c'était des chants, hein? Oui. Et lui, il est, Owen est tombé là, là, mais où? Dans ce, bois, dans ce petit bois-ci, mais où? où ça, c'est le terrain ici. C'était des terrains, ça aussi, c'était des chants. C'est des, 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 des pâtures à Jules Evrard. J'ai vu, par exemple, quand les Américains sont venus chercher. Euh, celui le premier qui est, qui est tombé là-bas, euh, c'était Jules Evrard de la Fosse en défrichant le bois <coughs> qui a retrouvé les eaux et la plaque d'immatriculation, sa plaque. Et j'ai vu là, à ce moment-là, quand ils sont venus avec une boîte en, 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 en bois, reprendre les eaux pour remettre tous les eaux dedans pour envoyer en Amérique. Ouais. Ça, c'était... Des... C'est lui qui avait fait, qui avait coupé les, tous les arbres. Uh -huh. et, et, oui. et, là, et là aussi. Et maintenant, on a planté. Et Owen est tombé là, là, où, à 50 mètres, où. Et Jules avait déjà enlevé tous les arbres, fait des, des pâtures, des champs, ça oui. et ça. Et ça, c'est déjà ouvert. Oui. Et, oui. Et, et lui, quand il a, je ne sais pas où, voilà, 50 mètres ou quoi, oui. il est tombé sur les, les, les eaux d'Owen. Oui. Alors, oui. il a pris la plaque, il est allé à la commune et il dit, voilà, j'ai retrouvé... Euh, parce que, d'après ce qu'on m'avait dit, il y avait déjà un civil qui avait trouvé avant. Ouais. Mais qui n'avait rien dit, qui avait pris peut-être des revolvers, je ne sais pas. Ah, oui, oui, oui. Qui avait oui, comme oui, oui, oui. dévalisé, si tu veux. Euh, ça, c'est le papier de Maïda, quand il cherche en National Archives. Euh, et, mais il manque beaucoup de pièces de son euh, cours. Oui. Uh, the IDPF yeah, says that um, when they found him, and that was in 1950, so it costed five years to find him, and when they found him, uh, his suit was. Uh, really burned his uh, air suit and also they found burn marks to the bone that deep uh, so th that's why we think that he already was uh, he died on the way to to the ground it's a really sad story but the next two ones were Walter Averly and Henry Maxim uh, they jumped way too late. The plane was already getting really low, flying over the hills towards where it crashed. They jumped out too late, parachute didn't open, and they fell to their death. Ça, ça n'existait pas, ça, hein? Le moteur a trouvé ici, hein, dans le champ, ici. Dans le champ. Ouais. Le moteur était là. Ouais. Dans le champ. Ouais. Et de là, il a perdu le moteur, et puis il est parti là. Il y a le chalet, là, hein? À gauche, là, et là, il y a les deux qui ont voulu sauter, mais trop bas, ouais. et puis... Donc, non, il y a des... Peut-être c'est parce qu'il a perdu un moteur, À mon ça avis, raison, euh, il... oui, parce que là, là il n'y avait pas des, des arbres, ni rien, là, hein. oui. c'était de, de, des champs comme ça, jusque au, au sapin, là-bas. C'était, à mon avis, c'était un beau terrain pour, es, pour essayer d'atterrir, ouais. hein. Il avait pas, il avait rien du tout, là. Et puis, le plane crashed, qui est toujours dans it, Ray Price, le pilote. Edward O'Rourke, the co-pilot, and John Tiedemann, the navigator, and they died while the plane crashed. He did tell me on the third day uh, that he did see some American infantry uh, personnel coming through the woods and he decided to make contact at that point. He said, I was, I was tired and I was cold and I was hungry. So he yelled out, uh, uh, hey Yanks, and um, the, uh, the infantrymen spotted him and came over to him and um, took him as a prisoner at that point. So they really weren't sure if he was an American or a German. They took him to a barn uh, until they got verification from England uh, saying who he was. So they put him in a barn overnight and uh, he told me, he'll never forget, he spent the night in a barn with, uh, piled up with dead German soldiers. The next morning, the, the, the soldiers had, had got word back from the air base in England that, that my dad was indeed, you know, um, shot down that day. So they had mentioned that there was another crew member down the road in another village said he was on your crew um, and that we would like you to come down and see if we could kind of piece this together.
Yeah, the, uh, Bob and Peter survived, and of course, Liam, Liam Liskamp also was alive, but he was brought back to Bitburg as a prisoner of war, and uh, brought back to Bitburg behind uh, the, at that time was a hospital, and uh, he was sent to the former Wehrmacht barracks. And unfortunately, on January the 2nd, 1945, uh, the, the barracks were bombed by, during an American air raid on uh, the town of Pittsburgh, and got killed during that air raid. My dad was a, a small business owner. He owned a, a tavern and a, and a restaurant. So um, I, I think a lot of times what he, he felt most comfortable uh, were times that we would close a business in the late hours of the night and we'd go for a coffee or maybe some breakfast. And uh, he, he would share those experiences with me. And I think there were certain periods of his life where losing two crews and living through that experience really bothered him. And um, I, I think he felt a need to talk about them. And a lot of times it was uh, late night, um, you know, maybe when, when things were a little quiet in his head and so forth. I think he wanted to share those uh, experience with me. Uh, and I, I think it was a way of, of, of him of, of kind of coming to terms with a little bit and talking about it. I think he needed to talk to somebody about it sometimes. And um, he, he always felt so bad losing uh, two crews, uh, especially at such a young age, and the sacrifices that uh, these guys made. And I just remember him saying a lot of times, and he'd say, those guys, he goes, those guys, they, they should be here. After finding all the documents, etc., we decided to give it uh, one more try um, and invite the team all the, the guys who were ever uh, involved in the research, we decided to invite them, including Myra. And Myra had contact with the family of uh, Peter Ferdinand and uh, they wanted to come too. As if finding the plane and uh, uh, this wasn't enough, um, Myra and Bob had uh, said, listen, um, we'd like you to come over to Belgium and we'd like you to come to the crash site and we, wanna, we want you to participate in a dig. We get off the plane and we, the first thing we do is go to Henri Chappelle Cemetery. And there we have Victor and Bob waiting for us at the cemetery. And Probably the most exciting point of all uh, was when we were coming down the ramp at um, Honor Chappelle. Victor was there waiting, Victor and Jacqueline. <laughs> when Victor hugged Peter, and shook his hand, you could see the relief on Victor's face. And I probably get a little emotional about that because to me, Victor got to touch the human being of this plane crash, this story that he's always wondered about all of his life. Oh, ben, je ne m'attendais pas à, à y avoir tant de monde. Et de rencontrer Peter Ferdinand pour la première fois. Oui. Comment c'était pour vous oh ben Pour moi, c'était émotionnel de, 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 de voir ça. Je ne pensais jamais voir arriver à, de, autant de monde sur, sur le site de l'avion ici. Hein. To actually meet someone that saw my father's plane get shot down that day, for him to be able to relay that story in, in real time, in person, and with, with such great detail, I, I can't describe it. It was, it was amazing. It was just utterly amazing. Um, Victor, if it wasn't for Victor, and his desire to, to honor this crew, 
uh, none of this would have came about. <laughs> Henry G. Maxim. We are still looking for a lot of information about him because he's very, very hard. Comment c'était ça pour toi d'aller à Henri Chapelle pour la première fois et voir toutes les tombes et tout ça Oui, mais ça, 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 ça c'est émotionnant aussi hein, d'aller voir. Ça, ça, je vais dire c'est beau à aller voir, mais c'est triste à aller voir. Hein. Arrived at the site, and uh, it it was it was a, to say it was a beautiful <laughs> beautiful location. Um, we uh, we met the crew that had an excavator there, and uh, it wasn't too long before we started actually getting to work digging in and finding these pieces. Uh, the the crew that was was there was uh, certainly dedicated to finding more pieces of history. Um, they didn't waste any time into digging and um, try and sift through this this land that contained all these pieces that the, that some were found previously. Uh, within no time, we were finding, uh, you know, small fragments of the plain were turning up rather easily. Um, the further we went out to dig, uh, the more we started to find. It was really exciting to find um, part of flak vest uh, that was embedded in the ground. Um, I think we may have found two of them. What's this piece? You see that? Yeah. Flag vest. So what you've got there, there is there were rivets on there. Yeah. This is um, this is uh, it's like an impregnated sort of thick canvas material. Yeah, it's almost like rubberized, and this this would have hung between the positions. So if you see, there's a bolt there. On the edge of it, yeah. you see the bolt on the edge. Look, right. just below where you fit. Just the bolt. Oh yeah, there would have been like a bolt hole somewhere there, probably snapped off. Okay. So that would have hung. So these would have hung down. So when they went into action, they'd have pulled these across to protect themselves from various positions, so the flat wouldn't travel through the fuselage. Oh. So basically, it's, it's unbelievable because, like, like I said before, I was standing here looking. I could visualize that plane in the smoke and you know on fire coming in. More, more. Let's get yeah. more. Here's a piece. Yeah, right, put it in the pile. Just Let's go dig some cool. more. Oh, oh that's yeah. that piece you cleaned it up. That looks there great. You go. Yeah, and that looks like a housing for a gauge. Yeah. yeah. Good job. Can you just imagine? Hit the jackpot here. <laughs> I recall um, that morning while we were uh, having breakfast. Um, someone had asked me, what would you like to find today? Uh, and I said, well, 
since my father was a radio operator, uh, I'd really like to find something belonging to his radio. Yeah, we found a real neat piece. Again, we found a radio part. Oh, oh. oh. upstairs. Perfect. By the trees, it says transmit. Oh, yes. Serial <laughs> number. And there it said yeah, USA. Wow. How about that? How did you find numbers. that? By accident. <laughs> By accident. He over it and he decided to bend over it. <laughs> almost the only uh, beep we got there. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. Not an accident. That was meant to be. That yeah. Was meant yeah. To be. yeah. So we, we must clean it, but uh, of course I think. Of course, he's a very uh, good digger. Yeah. You know, excellent. Wow. wow. It's yeah. so oh. tiny and so important yeah. to my brother. It's very tiny. Oh, yeah. thank you. Wow. Shall we clean it first? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Make sure we, we have the serial number on. on. Yeah. Here, put yeah. your hand out there and get it. <gasps> yeah. That's and cool. Show the camera. Gosh. Oh wow! Awesome. Huh. <sighs> I'm just going to turn it over. Yeah. Perfect. Wow. That's great. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, I could do that. Thank you. Yeah. And then yeah. on this we start finding some other small pieces. Uh, we found pieces of a transistor that we think that was was, you know, part of my father's radio. A tag belonging to some radio equipment. My favorite piece was finding a part of my father's radio. Uh, there was a, a headset, being my father was a radio operator, he obviously used a headset. Um, to find this uh, was just, it just brought a lot of, uh, just a lot of emotion uh, and, and I just couldn't believe that I actually found something that was, you know, attached to my father at some point all this time and just being buried in the ground and uh, these are all things that, that was definitely on my father's plane and very well could have been things that he used. So to find that stuff in the ground 73 years later was absolutely astonishing. So we can la. Oui, ça m'a changé. Oui. Oui, ça. Oui, oui, oui. Ça. Et j'aurais bien voulu <coughs> aussi, pardon, mettre, fait, mettre une pierre, mettre une stèle, enfin, ça qui qu'on a fait aussi. On December 25th, 1944, the King Size, belonging to the 8th Air Force, 389th Bomb Group, the 565th Bomb Squadron, was on its way home to Hattel Air Base in England after a mission on Walen, when it was attacked by 15 Germ German fighters. Halt! Halt! Content, fier d'avoir mis la stèle quand même. On a reçu la, la, une délégation américaine même qui est venue à l'inauguration de la stèle. Non, ça, ça c'était bien, c'était beau. On a eu des discours. On a... The plane got in the spin, but pilot Raymond Price got it back under control and managed to pr proceed direction home. But when it reached the area of La Fosse, the plane came under another attack, a second time by five German fighters. Several crew members got wounded, and the nose turret gunner Bob Ball shot down one of the proper wolves. The king size was losing altitude, and thick black smoke was coming from the plane. Come on, la vie. The shows like the qui avait qui a tiré les 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 neuf coups. François Hubert qui est venu tirer neuf fusées pour les neuf passagers de l'avion. Non, c'était beau, c'était bien. For a man to do this, for Victor to do this, okay, it was just fabulous. I mean, that man is so dedicated in, in doing what he was, uh, you know, to do all of this. It was just just out of this world. And to have the, the whole 
bunch of people there, the honor guard, all of the military equipment and, and everyone has a reenactment in their uniforms and whatnot up and down the road. It, it was just great. And then as they were reading the names off and have the fireworks going off, like the bombs bursting in air, it was, it was absolutely amazing. It, like I said before, I think if it wasn't for Victor, none of this would have happened. I mean, that man was fabulous. Tu étais très content. Et encore maintenant. Mais je vois la stèle tous les jours, parce que de, de chez moi, je, je, je vois la stèle. Alors tu vois, quand Jacques et moi, j'ai dit, hé hey Jacqueline, il y a Bob au monument. Alors d'ici, je vois la voiture de Bob. Non. Faudrait bien nettoyer ici aussi, hein. On va chercher de nouveaux plantes ici, ou c'est euh, la commune qui fait ça Oui. Okay. Oui, mais si vous ne la faites pas, je mets. Hein, mais non, c'est pour quoi ouais, euh... C'est la mettre. Ouais. Ouais, J'espère qu'on va chercher la photo euh, ouais, hein. décembre. Di directement que j'ai les, les, les autres photos, je cherche. Ouais. Voilà, je viens par ici. Tu vois, c'est cet arbre-là, hein j'ai coupé les branches comme ça, je, avec ça je vois le monument. Hein. C'est ici, hein Ici. Ouais. Et moi je vois le monument là-haut. Donc tous les mois, tu coupes un petit peu Un petit peu. Parce que maintenant elle va grandir. Oui, 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 non. Je, je, je le coupe un peu, je vois comme il faut. Je le vois encore, hein, mais je. Non. Ouais. Et celui-là, il était déjà là à ce moment-là. Hein. Il pouvait parler, lui, celui-là.